Good morning. You're gonna make me sound crazy. I mean, it's louder than all of you combined. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's you're awake. That's great. <laughs> uh, good morning. It's it's good to be with you uh, this morning, and uh, hopefully you can stomach my voice for another 20, 30 minutes here, and then we'll get through this together. But uh, now, appreciate your attention in class, and uh, appreciate the way in which you participated in our worship so far this morning. We can see God's design. I I needed worship this morning to refocus me. Uh, after after a long week, uh, parenthood is tiring, as it turns out, actually. I don't know if any of you knew that or had experienced that, but yeah, it's it's actually kind of tiring. So anyway, um, uh, I, I'm encouraged, I'm strengthened by our time together this morning. So thanks, thanks for worshiping uh, with us this morning. Let's say you had a friend who asked you, I know, crazy, crazy idea, right? So you had a friend, but, uh, but let's say you had a friend <laughs> who asked you to tell them about God. I said, okay, you, you believe in God, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, tell me about him. What's he like? So you try to come up with a list of, well, what are the most important things about God? The things that really describe, you know, who he is and what he's like. And obviously, such an exercise is kind of doomed to failure in one sense that, you know, we're finite and we're trying to describe the infinite. God is infinite and beyond our comprehension in some sense. Uh, but scripture reveals a lot about God to us. So while in one sense God is beyond our comprehension, surely there must be at least some other sense in which we do need to understand some things about him or understand him to some degree. Uh, so as we think through scripture about the things that we do know about God, what would be on your list? Uh, maybe the idea that God is love. That's pretty important. That's all throughout scripture. Um, that'd be, be a good starting point. Maybe the idea that God is creator. It's kind of the starting point of, of the Bible, right? It's a very biblical and important uh, place to start. Uh, we could even bring up how God is constant. God is unchanging. We could look at how he makes promises in the Old Testament and he always keeps them. Or in the New Testament, about how, like in James 1 verse 17, talks about how God doesn't change. Every good gift comes uh, from the Father of lights with whom there is no, no, no change, no shadow due to turning. Uh, we could talk about how God is triune, that He is Father, Son, and Spirit. And talk about the, the, the Trinity, also biblical, also critically important. All these things well deserving of being on the list of things that we would tell our friend who wants to know about God, I think. Uh, who wants to know about who He is, what He's like. But I want to suggest something else this morning that I think belongs on that list. And perhaps it's something that would be on your list. And uh, if so, that's great. It's not something that, that no one's ever thought of. I'm not trying to blow any minds here this morning with this, this concept. Uh, but I do think this aspect of God is something that is both encouraging to us as believers and challenging to us as believers, and also encouraging and challenging to non-believers alike. Um, and because of that, I think it's, it's worth a sermon being preached about it. So enough setup, enough beating around the bush uh, about all this this morning. I want to talk with you this morning about the idea that something central to God's nature is the fact that he is a God who brings order from chaos. God is a God who brings order out of chaos. I think the Bible shows us that God continually brings order from chaos, and he does so uh, continually. And I think the Bible shows us that for a reason. I think it's intentional that that is all over Scripture because the fact that God turns chaos into order, it's central to who He is. It's a core part of His nature. It, it's so much of what He does, and it helps us understand so much about what He is like. And so I want to look with you this morning at four biblical ways or scenarios even in which God either has made order from chaos, He is currently making order from chaos, or He will bring order out of chaos as He has promised. And so the first of those, I'd invite you to the very beginning of your Bible, open to the very first page of Scripture in Genesis chapter 1. The first of those ways that God has made order out of chaos is actually in creation. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 is a text that I think we know well. If we grow up in Bible class at all, grow up in Sunday school and hearing sermons, maybe we even memorized the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? A fundamental passage for us to understand as believers in God. And I think the emphasis that that verse gets, that it's so universally known, is important and is, it rightfully gets that, that emphasis. And yet, 
Perhaps the emphasis on verse 1 leads us to kind of de-emphasize verse 2. And verse 2 is also really important. Read with me in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 2 is important as well. Why is verse 2 important? You would think this foundational truth that God is powerful and He made everything there is, isn't that the most important thing we can get from Genesis 1? Well, absolutely, it's very important. But verse 2 tells us something else important, and that is that the, the earth was without form and void. Why would God do that? You ever notice how weird that is? Why, why wouldn't He just make a world that's plug and play, right? That's ready to go out of the box. Was he not able to do that? Is he incapable? He had to do it this way? No, I don't think that's the case at all. Scripture shows us God can do anything. He's all-powerful. So why did he do that? Why did he do it this way? Well, I think God's trying to tell us something important about himself by doing it this way. And specifically, we see how God creates the world as he goes about forming this which is formless and filling that which is void. And as we go through the rest of the creation account, he does this in a very orderly fashion. Notice, first of all, he takes that which was formless and he gives it form. In verse 4, he gives light. He separates the light from the darkness. So there's, there's form. There is structure to the light. And then in verse 7, uh, verse 7 says, And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. What's God doing? He's separating the waters above and the waters below. He's making order. He is, he is forming that which is formless. Everything is all jumbled up, all chaotic, all, all, all messed up in a sense, and God orders it. He gives separation. He puts things in categories. And then in verse 9, God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. What's he doing there? He's separating the land and the seas. He's giving form to this world. He's shaping it. And then the land features are also made uh, in that section. The earth sprouting its vegetation to distinguish the land from the sea. So all these constructs that we know as just the basis of nature, light and land and sea and sky and, and earth and terrain, God is making all of those he walks us through that, days one through three. These are one day at a time, right? Well, how about days four, five, and six? What does God do? Well, He fills that which was void. So you see the parallel here. God, on day one, separates the light from the darkness. But on day four, He fills it with the sun, the moon, and the stars. He fills the daytime with the sun and the nighttime with the moon and the stars. And we see that in verse 16 there. And then in verse 20, uh, this happens. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Okay, on that second day, God separated the waters above and the waters below. And on the fifth day, God makes the birds for the waters above. He fills the skies and he fills the sea with sea creatures. And then finally... On day six, God makes land animals and he makes man. See that in verses 24 and 26. And guess what he's doing? He's filling the land. You see, God is doing this intentionally. This is not some hodgepodge of just, well, we needed to describe all this stuff. I mean, if, if all God wanted to get across was, I made all this stuff, we only needed verse one. But no, he, he shows us this for a reason, I think. And that's to show us something about him. But the creation account here in Genesis 1, I don't think it's just here because, well, this is how it starts. And so it's chronologically prior, so we might as well start here. I think Genesis 1 is showing us something foundational about God, and that is that God brings order from chaos. God takes that which is chaotic and, and confusing and, and mixed up and, and everything is out of order, and he makes it orderly. And that continues throughout the biblical narrative. That's what we see God do time and again in circumstance after circumstance, with people after people even. God takes that which is chaotic and formless and void like the earth, and he fills it with life. 
He fills it with order and he even fills it with beauty. So creation sets us up for this. It shows us this key truth about God that this is, this is who God is. This is what he's like. He takes that which is chaotic and he makes it beautiful. He gives it order. He gives it structure. That's what God is like. So first of all, creation shows us this. From the very beginning, God is a God who brings order from chaos. But not only does creation show us that, there are several people throughout Scripture who show us that. And we could, we could go to all kinds of people and look at people whose lives were in all kinds of shambles before they came to God, and then afterward God turned it around. But one that I want to look at with you this morning is actually the example of Rahab. Rahab is somebody that we studied recently in our Joshua class. If, if you want to make your way over to Joshua chapter 2, I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of flipping here with me this morning as we look at these four instances. But uh, Joshua chapter 2 d- describes Rahab. Let's, let's read that account together and see how God does this with Rahab as well. And Joshua, the son of Nun, this is Joshua 2 and verse 1, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you for the Lord your God. He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Rahab shows extraordinary faith, really. But what a lot of times we notice, and understandably so, right off the bat is, Rahab's got some problems. I mean, she lied. I guess she's praised later on in the New Testament, we'll get to that, for for her faith, but yet she lies. I've heard a lot of Bible classes, not just here, discuss that idea in depth. People trying to figure out how do we square this with the fact that she is, she's praised later on, but she lied. How, what are we supposed to do with that? She, she's a liar. She, she's sinning. That's wrong. I understand that. But then, of course, you have the slightly bigger issue, perhaps, of she's also a prostitute. And that's a problem, too, right? Not only is she a liar, she's a lying prostitute. That's pretty bad, right? Even people in our world today, we look at that and we say, okay, that, that is bad. You, you don't have to be a Christian to say that's, that's a rough lifestyle, That's something not favorably looked upon in the world. So that's a lot of times what we see in Rahab. And it's true. Those things are accurate about her. But what's the point? Well, let's see how Rahab's story ends. In Matthew chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but if you're familiar with the Gospel of Matthew at all, you know that Matthew starts with a genealogy. Ever made it through that? It's kind of a slug to get through it. The genealogy of scripture, not the most fun text. Uh, but Matthew has an important genealogy. It shows us how Jesus came to be on the earth. And guess who's included in that in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5? Rahab. Rahab is in the lineage of Jesus. So what we can gather from that is that she actually became part of God's people. And eventually, David came from her. And Jesus even came from her. But not only there, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, guess what Rahab's remembered for? Not her lying, not her prostitution, but she's remembered for her faith. Rahab is praised for her faith 
In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, she's praised for giving a friendly welcome to the spies by faith. She didn't perish with all the rest of the people who were in the land along with her, who were from her country. And so how does her story end? It ends in faith. What is God showing us with Rahab? Is the point that we're supposed to try to figure out, well, how did she lie and how did this work? And are we supposed to be okay with this? And, and what's, what's, what are all the legal implications of this? I don't think so. I think what the scriptures would have us focus on, we consider both the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures about her, is not her past life, but her faith that led her to come to God. And I think we need to focus on how God transformed her and worked through her. Rahab is a mess. There's no doubt about it. Her life is kind of a disaster, but it's not how it starts. For the, the biblical writers, it's about how it finishes. And as best we know, Rahab came to faith and her life changed. Because she, came, she became part of the people of God. and She became part of the lineage of David, the greatest king of physical Israel, and even of Jesus, the greatest king of spiritual Israel, the greatest king who there ever was. But what do we see? We don't see her doing this on her own, being like, I'm going to become a better person. That's not what happens. She comes to God in faith. She says, I've heard about the Lord, and I'm putting my faith in Him. Now swear to me by Him that you'll take care of me. She's showing her faith in Him, and it is God that transforms her life from chaos, all kinds of moral chaos, sin, beyond what many of us could even imagine, perhaps, to beauty. Not just order, certainly that, but even something beautiful. A life from which even the Son of God would come on the earth. Rahab's a great picture of that. Uh, as a person who God brought from chaos to order. He brought order even out of the great chaos of her life. But the truth is, Rahab is not the only one to whom that has happened. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the key, verse 11. And such were some of you. But, don't you love it when Scripture says, but... Those are some of the most wonderful passages in all the Bible. This is how you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The truth is, folks, Rahab's story, creation's story, it's our story too. You see that? God is a God who brings order from chaos. He brought order from chaos in the very beginning with creation. He brought order from all kinds of moral chaos in Rahab's life. But guess what? That's what he's done with each and every one of us today. We all have our story to tell about our past life of sin before we came to God. I'm sure we could spend all morning just going around the room hearing about people's lives who were changed by coming to God. And that's a great use of time. I think we ought to do more of that. And even after we become Christians... We've all got our story to tell about sin that God has empowered us to overcome then in ways, Keith was talking about that in class today, ways that God has enabled us to change. We still need God's strength and God's empowerment and God's enablement to become more like Jesus even after we become Christians. But let me encourage us all, like Rahab, let us focus on that in our spiritual view of ourselves and our spiritual view of others. Not focusing on our past sin and just getting dragged down so that we never move forward, but like Rahab, letting the past go and moving forward into the people of God, moving forward into a whole new life that God gives as the God who brings order from chaos. And sometimes we think the hardest thing is to get others to view us as these new people, as a new creation in Christ, as people who have been forgiven of these sins, but sometimes the hardest thing is for us to view ourselves that way. 
But guess what God says, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, you were washed. You were sanctified. You're no longer those other, peop those other people. Such were some of you, but you were changed. So view yourself this way, 2 Corinthians 5. We don't view people that way. We view them as a new creation if they're in Christ. So not only should we view others that way, we've got to view ourselves that way too. However, now that we view ourselves that way, now that we have turned back from our, from our past life as Rahab turned from hers, and now that we have been made into a new creation, here's what 1 Corinthians 6 continues to say about us. Beginning in verse 12, Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. First of all, do you notice all the talk about prostitution in that text? Who does that remind us of? It reminds us of Rahab, doesn't it? That calls back to her image, and yet, what does Paul say? Yeah, maybe that was your past, but that's not how you are anymore. You have to be different. You have to be changed. And so he concludes, you're not your own anymore. So what's the call for us as those who have been brought from chaos to order in Christ? Don't live like you're your own anymore. Instead, glorify God in your body. That's the conclusion. Rahab is praised because from what we know of her, she didn't turn back into her former life. She left that behind. And with faith in God, she moved forward into God's people and became what God wanted her to be. And so we need to be like Rahab in that way, 1 Corinthians 6 would tell us. Don't turn back, don't shrink back and be destroyed. But move forward, live a new life, not as our own, but as God's, God's new creation in Christ Jesus. And so the conclusion that Paul comes to in verse 20 is just so perfect. So glorify God in your that's what we all have to do. I'm now realizing I'm a point behind us. That's every single one of us. May he bless us as we seek not to turn back, but to press on and to preserve our souls and to glorify God in our bodies, which are new creations, which are temples of God. It's a beautiful thing. Even with us, God has brought our chaos, our, our helpless state, and he has made order out of it, He's also made beauty out of it. But finally, the fourth way in which God shows us that he brings order from chaos is something that hasn't happened yet, and that is in the new creation. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 with me. 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's begin reading in verse 7 of 2 Peter chapter 3. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this, this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But, verse 13, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What does this text tell us? It tells us that what God has done with the initial creation, what God has done with Rahab, 
what God has done with so many others throughout biblical history and what God has done with us, he will also do in the new creation one day. There is chaos here right now. I don't have to convince you of that, do I? You look all around, you see all kinds of chaos, moral chaos, political chaos, uh, personal chaos, relational chaos, family chaos. Our world is chaotic. It is upside down. It is messed up. But God's going to do something about that one day. It's not chaotic because God didn't thoroughly make order in the original creation. It's chaotic because of sin. That's what we see around us, the effects of sin. That's caused all the problems in the world. But what God's going to do one day is he's going to judge the world for that sin. And he's going to refine. That's the language of all that fire that's talked about there. I don't know if it's going to be literal or if it's metaphorical or how God's going to do this exactly, but I do know that in Scripture, fire is a refining element. It is a purifying element. That's what fire does, and that's what God, I think, is showing us in the big picture here. He's going to refine the heavens and the earth into something that is new and that is, once again, very good. And in that fire, what will be left behind and burned up will be all that made the world chaotic. He's going to do away with that. He's going to make the new creation into something, verse 13, in which righteousness dwells. And that's going to be very good for those of us who have been made into a new creation ourselves and who will fit into this new creation, who will come through that refining fire stronger than ever through God and through Christ. But God doesn't want anyone to be part of the other side of that, the judgment that takes place on that day as he removes that sin and that impurity from the creation. He doesn't want people to be part of that. He says that in verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient. That's why he hasn't done it yet. He's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would reach repentance. And so there's that call for everyone, not just us who already have been made new, have been made orderly and been made beautiful by God, but for everyone to repent. God wants that for everyone so that in the new creation, all can enjoy that time and that place in which righteousness dwells. How has he made it possible for us to be saved from our sin? How has he made it possible for this transformation to happen? He has offered to take our sinful, our chaotic lives and transform them through and into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's how. What a gift. Give that serious thought. No matter whether you have already accepted God's offer of transformation, of making order from your chaos or not, make sure that you have been refined by God into Christ's image. And having been refined, here's the call for all of us, do not turn back to your former life. Live as God's new creation. Live as God's new created order that foreshadows what is to come and the glorious new creation, the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. What a promise that God has made. And as we've seen in the book of Joshua, not one promise of God's fails. It'll take great trust for us to believe that God is going to do that. But if we believe it, it changes the way that we live. As 1 Corinthians 6 says, we all of a sudden live like we are not our own. We live to glorify God in our bodies each and every day. That's the new order that God has brought about in our lives. Praise Him for that. Let us all be true to Him, to what He has asked of us in this new life, and never turn back again to our sin. So let's all submit to God in a way that we can be thankful every day that He is the God who turns chaos not only into order, but even into beauty, into beautiful things, as He's done in creation, as He's done in Rahab, as he's done in us and in countless others who have submitted to his transforming work, and as he will do one day in making the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We want everyone to be part of that beautiful reality that is coming. It's a beautiful transformation God has done with each and every one of us who are in Christ. It'll be even greater and even more beautiful when we see it all realized fully in the new creation. We want everyone to be part of that, and so does God. But you have to repent. That's what God says. Repent and turn from that past life. Be willing. Submit yourself to God's transforming work. And he can bring that order from that chaos. Turn your life into something beautiful, greater than you ever thought possible. If you have that spiritual need this morning, we want to help you. 
you'll make it known while together we stand and while we sing.